<laughs> okay. Uh, we have a, and thank you once again, Don, for your help. We appreciate it. Could we have a reader one and a reader two? I'll be reader one. Thank you, sweetheart. And a uh, reader two, someone? I'll be reader two. Thank you, Jane. <clears throat> we give this day to our Lord as we ask for his guidance. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let your word, Father, be a lamp for our feet and light to our path so that we may understand what you wish to teach us and follow the path your light marks out for us. Uphold those who hope in you, Lord Jesus, and give us your counsel so that we may know the joy of your resurrection and deserve to be among the saints at your right hand. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and what you have heard from me before my witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Psalm 16, preserve me God, I take refuge in you. I say to the Lord, you are my God, my happiness lies in you alone. He has put into my heart a marvelous love for the faithful ones who dwell in his land. Those who choose other gods increase their sorrows. Never will I offer their offerings of blood. Never will I take their name upon my lips. O oh Lord, it is you who are my por portion and cup. It is you yourself who are my prize. The lot marked out for me is my delight. Welcome indeed the heritage that falls to me. When I see his face, O Lord, I shall know the fullness of the glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel, who even at night directs my heart. I keep the Lord ever in my sight, since he is at my right hand. I shall stand firm. And so my heart rejoices, my soul is glad, even my body shall rest in safety. For you will not leave my soul among the dead, nor let your beloved know decay. You will show me the path of life, the fullness of joy in your presence, at your right hand, happiness forever. When I see your face, O Lord, I shall the fullness of joy. Hallelujah. Okay, so let's see, we are out on lesson nine and our memory verse is, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and what you have heard from me before many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And then we turn to page... 60. And the first question. All right. What is the Didache and what does it have to say about the Mass? Uh, uh, um. I have uh, the teaching of the 12 apostles and uh, the mass is the sacrifice that was spoken by the Lord. Thank you. And I have, it gives a description of what the early liturgy was like. Right. Other thoughts? Uh, well, it was uh, written in 50 AD, this document was. Yes. Around that area. Yes. I have, it's the oldest text from the patristic era and predates even some of the New Testament documents. It was also known as teaching of the 12 apostles. Over and over, it uses the word sacrifice, saying that the mass is the sacrifice that was spoken of by the Lord. Yes. So that's the answer I was looking for. I didn't catch that. Sacrifice. 
Yeah. Because it, it asks about the mass. Mm -hmm. That's right. I turned, I went and uh, clicked on a person who has evidently some kind of a, I don't know if it's online or how, how it is, but he was saying that the Didache also mentions uh, how to detect full, a true and false apostles. And it also said it mentions uh, about abortion. Yeah. Oh, Evidently, people had abortions even then. Yeah. Didn't we talk about that last week or was I reading it somewhere where that's how they controlled mm -hmm. the, uh, mm -hmm. they would let maybe one child or one girl live, but the right. girls were dispensable. So right. there was something last week in the notes about <clears throat> some of the drain pipes were filled yes. with baby right. boats. And they assumed they were mostly girls. Oh my mm. goodness. That's right. <clears throat> mm. Other thoughts? Okay. Number two, name two of the fathers who defended the primacy of Peter and Rome. Saint one, one of them is Saint Clement, uh, and he writes. The Corinthians were putting away uh, their their priests uh, or their leaders, and he writes to them and says, "Don't do that. Stop that." And because he was the bishop of Rome, even though he's far away from Corinth, that. His, the authority of that office was the what carried the day, if you will, and they reinstated their priests, and, and I, I don't know if they put away their bishop, but but uh, they reinstated them. So that was the, the first defense of the primacy. And that was St. Clement? Clement of Rome. All right, thank you. That's around between 90 and 100 AD. Thank you. And what do you mean put away? Did you say put away? Well, they, they had deposed. Would that be another? Oh, okay. Okay, they, they, they set them aside and said, uh, no, we don't like these priests. We want somebody else, you know, and, and saying, no, you, can, you, don't, you don't have the right to do that. Okay. Other thoughts? Mm -hmm. I had St. Augustine and St. Jerome. Yes. I had St. Cyprian recognize that faithfulness to the church <coughs> yeah. meant faithfulness to the authority of Peter. Mm -hmm. Yes. Much Other? earlier, St. Irenaeus of uh, Lyon uh, talked about the primacy of the church in Rome. You know, he's in Lyon <coughs> in France, and so he, he's already talking about that. And kind of obliquely, I would say, uh, St. Ignatius of Antioch, because he's talking about unity, and uh, by the, the time he's on his way to Rome to be uh, tossed to the lions or whatever happened to him, uh, you know, to be killed, uh, he they are, they already are rec have already recognized Rome as the um, the primacy, the prime church. So um, that's kind of an oblique one, though. Yes. Uh, I have um, also St. Ambrose of Milan. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Moving on to number so why nine. Why is St. Ambrose important? Okay, why was St. Ambrose of okay. Milan important? What do we know about him? Oh, Let's God. look him up. <laughs> okay. I didn't go that far. Yeah. He's the one who um, basically convinced um, uh, Augustine to, to join the, to become, I don't know if Augustine was already a, a, a baptized, but to become uh, a member of the church, you know, in other words, 
he and St. Monica are really important in convincing Augustine to become, uh, uh, shall we say, an active Catholic and then ultimately a, a uh, priest and then bishop. Thank so you, great. Gary. He's a really important guy. Thank you. Just Did a little background there. Yeah, I appreciate that. Is it Augustine or Augustine? Yes. It depends on your language. Which language? Oh. Good, good question. <laughs> tomato, tomato. <laughs> okay. Okay, now we're on number nine. <laughs> what is the what is the source of the church's unity? The Eucharist. The Eucharist. The Eucharist. Yes. And um, through the Eucharist, we become one body of one Christ. Body. One body of Christ. Yeah. Well, I wrote the Bishop of Rome, the Pope. Mm. Well, that's true. Yeah. That's very true. Think of the uh, Orthodox uh, churches who don't recognize the Pope, and yet they seem to have the uh, uh, authority of orders and the other elements, other sacraments. We also have apostolic lineage. Right. Mm -hmm. I never really thought about the sacrament of holy orders at the Last Supper. Mm -hmm. um, I never did either, but it it makes a good case for it. It sure does, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if, uh, if you travel uh, around the world to different countries or, or even different states here in the United States, when you go to mass on Sunday, you know, that's the one thing that unites us all, you know, is the Eucharist. And if, if you go to a foreign country and you don't even know the language, you can follow the mass because it, it, it goes through its steps, yes. you know, uh, of the mass and you can follow it all along. You know, if you're in uh, Mexico, you're in uh, Italy, you're in uh, Israel. I mean, it's amazing, you know, and you may not understand the, the words, but we've gone to the mass enough so you can follow the all the steps of the mass it's really amazing oh it's it's a wonderful feeling to yeah. be in a foreign country <laughs> and and to be at a catholic mass yeah it, it, it um, unites us it unites us when it's we, like being with family it's still, yeah. still having your family around you yes mm -hmm. when we were traveling in europe i didn't really settle uh until we had been to mass and then all my anxiety just drifted away and I was fine then. Oh, good point. Same thing in Portugal or even England, just being centered through a mass. Yeah. was wonderful. Well, yeah. we've lost one of the unifying forces that for me was always a comfort. Uh, whenever I entered a Catholic church, there was the little red light Oh, yes. Indicating the presence of God in the yeah. in the tabernacle, yeah. and we've lost that here. I don't know what uh, the worldwide practice is now. You know, I I said it wrong. I said it's like being with family. It is being with family, and as you were saying, it is home. That's our home, also. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I like that. Yes. When my husband and I moved to France for six months in uh, 2001, we had to find a place to live. And we were driving around the outskirts of Paris. And I said, well, first we have to find the Catholic church. Good. <laughs> and I, God was very good because we ended up uh, living very close to where my husband was working at Euro Disney. And I was able to walk to church and the most precious thing was behind, it was like, a, it was modern architect, but behind the church was this large pond or it was a large pond and there was two swans in it. And anybody that knows me personally knows that I love swans. And I, I have a picture of it, when I have my computer, I have a picture of what I just told you on my computer. It's just oh. so 
was so sweet. Beautiful. Can, can we go back to the first question? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I guess the first number one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, this is from the Didache, which I have on my phone. And I, um, anyway, it's chapter 14, and it's called uh, Christian Assembly on the Lord's Day. So, so here, here we are in, you know, around 50 AD, and they've already uh, established a practice of Sunday Mass. Sunday Mass, of getting to, of assembling on the Lord's Day. Okay, and and I don't know when this trans this translation's done, so it's kind of old English. So bear with me here. But every Lord's Day, gather yourselves together and break bread, and give thanksgiving, after having confessed your transgressions, that your sacrifice may be pure. How do we start the mass? That's exactly how we we you know we confess. Uh, usually uh, at, at, well, many, many masks. Uh, let no one who is at odds with his fellow come together with you until they have reconciled that your sacrifice may not be profane. For this is that which is spoken of by the Lord in every place and time offer to me a pure sacrifice for I am the great king, says the Lord, and my name is wonderful among the nations. That's, that's the uh, slightly different translation of this sacrifice spoken of by the Lord. So that's, that's actually where you see it is in chapter 14, which is not a, about, not exactly about the, um, the Eucharist, but if you go back a couple of, uh, of uh, chapter nine is actually about the, the Eucharist and it talks about the cup and the bread. And, and then it, the last paragraph of that says, let no one eat or drink of your Eucharist unless they have been baptized in the name of the Lord. For concerning this also the Lord has said, give not that which is holy to the dog. Okay, there you are. That's, that's Thank you, Gary. Question. Yeah. Gary, I was going to ask you, uh, uh, the Lord's Day, <clears throat> I mean, uh, the, the first follower, followers of Jesus uh, were Jews, and a lot of the first converts were Jews, besides the Gentiles coming in afterwards, but they always uh, uh, kept the Sabbath on Saturday, and so the church later on, I guess, changed that to Sunday because of the resurrection. Do, do you have any idea when, when that occurred? Well, no, I don't, but I, this is, this was written in, in or around 50 AD. I've heard some uh, scholars saying as early as 48 AD um, on this. Some people will say it's 60 or 70 AD too. So, you know, it's some, some range in there, but by that time, you probably didn't hear it. Well, the Lord's Day is is Sunday. It, it's the day. Sunday. No, I, I don't think it does. But it's commonly known that the Lord's Day is the day of resurrection. So they, you know, the early convert converts would have gone to. They would have uh, observed the Sabbath on Saturday. On Saturday, and Sunday is not the Sabbath. We sometimes call it that but that's not what it is it's not the sabbath the right. sabbath is saturday uh you know friday night saturday uh the lord's day is sunday and it's always been been that uh i i don't know when when it transitioned but i'm going to ask our spanish speakers what's the name of sunday in spanish domingo domingo the lord right yes. um you know it, in in all of the the romance language uh countries they call it something like dominos or domingo or whatever it, it's the lord's day it, it was always known as that um you know the only reason we don't say that is because our language comes uh, out of german and sunday is zontag and so 
<laughs> you know, <the laughs> sun day is literally what it is. So there you go. Thank you. I can remember I'm asking my son-in-law, if you remember, he was an Orthodox priest. And um, I asked him, I said, how did we get Sunday to be the day of worship? And he said, well, he said, there really isn't anything written in stone about that, but yeah. think about it. He said, you had, you had Saturday for the Jews to go over and worship. And if you were Jewish, that was instilled in you. Okay. He said, but then if you turn Christian, you would want to go over and also be with your Christian people with fellowship and of course the Eucharist. He said, and so they made it on Sunday. I remember the nuns telling us that we have it on Sunday because that was the day the Lord rose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Resurrection. Mm. So between the two of them, they made sense to me. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I apologize for the ring and so on. I forgot to <laughs> mute. Okay, <clears throat> let's go on to um, the second number one. <laughs> <laughs> um, what made Leo great? Well, I think there were a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. One of them is that he reportedly confronted virtually all the known heresies of the day. Mm -hmm. And I, that, I think, was an absolute miracle that the church did not splinter into a thousand pieces. Mm -hmm. And he was responsible for that. He was also known for talking Attila the Hun mm -hmm. yes. into not uh, sacking Rome. And to get a guy like that to turn around and go home <clears throat> means he was good. <laughs> yes, he was great. Right. So there are a variety of, of reasons, I think, that he deserves that. Uh, yes. And, and the heresy that he really focused on was the one that did not adhere to the fact that there were two natures with whim, within Christ, both human and divine. Mm -hmm. And that became the basis for um, one of the councils, the council at Chalcedon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he was, he was able to take that one heresy specifically that was so divisive and um, address it. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think Thank you, Margaret. in that council, didn't he write the Tome of Leo, which was a, yes. basically <laughs> an overarching, uh, organized approach to topics that should be discussed by the church as a whole. Mm -hmm. And he's only one of two popes that they consider great. Uh, and also his uh, feast day is tomorrow. Oh, uh, I noticed that. I have a question. Oh, though. you get an extra point. Okay. I have a question. <laughs> um, uh, how, how is, who, dis, I mean, is it just like when they decide someone's going to be a saint? Because uh, I was just wondering why Pope John Paul II is not considered uh, also a great does anybody, uh, Gary or Rita or anybody, have an answer to that? Here's the definition of Greek. No, no, I don't have an answer for that. No, I think there were some uh, elements in the church who referred to him as the great uh, colloquially, but uh, he wasn't officially designated as such. Well, he was the Pope that was, you know, when I became Catholic. So I just, I really, really like him a lot. He also did reaffirm papal authority. Mm. Was it he who, who came up with the luminous mysteries? That was, that was Pope John Paul. John Paul, John, okay. Well, he certainly, in my mind, did enough to become great. I mean, if you think of all the things that he accomplished and did and 
you know, there's just so many to, to, to name and, for, and from the background that he came from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he stared down Russia the Hun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, uh, between, between him and, uh, uh, you know, what was going on in Poland, uh, that, that he supported it, you know, what I, there's a story that, I, you know, I, I don't know. I think he went to Krakow, but it may have been Warsaw. <clears throat> and he's giving a speech and, you know, and the people are, are there saying, we want God. And, and they just kept saying, you know, it became a chant, right? That we mm. want God, we want God, we want God. And in essence, that trip broke the back of, uh, of, of Russia. I mean, it, or at least put the crack in the back that they could not hold the, the, the Polish people uh, away from their religion. And once you do that, communism and, and socialism falls apart because uh, people know where they're where the source of their life is and, and all their rights and it's not from the state. So that, that starts taking things apart. And mm -hmm. I guess we're, gonna, we're gonna forget that uh, for a few years here. Yeah, EWTN did a very uh, good program on the divine plan that showed uh, the Pope, Reagan and Thatcher yeah. in behind the scenes and uh, the United States was using the CIA to go and communicate directly with the, with the Pope. And they were the mainstay of why the, the Iron Curtain came down. Right. And also they discovered that the assassin uh, that uh, shot the, the Pope was actually sent by the Russians. And uh, they contracted with the Bulgarians to send that assassin there to shoot him. And so they have very, real good evidence that it was the Russians behind him because of what he was doing in Poland. Those Russians. No, I've, I've never met in this country, I've never met a Polish person that wasn't extremely devout to our faith. Mm -hmm. Maybe our landlord will leave it alone. <laughs> yeah. What was that you said under your breath, Joanne? <laughs> Maybe our Man's landlord out. in Inglewood, I think he was part of the Polish Gestapo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Most of the tenants Seriously. there uh, thought he was a, a Nazi prison camp guard. Yeah. <laughs> he would patrol the balconies. Yeah. <laughs> Franzak, that was his name. Yeah. <laughs> Joanne and Ron, you guys look so cute that you you you, you color coordinated. coordinated. You get dressed. <laughs> They're getting ready for uh, Advent. You know, they're starting to get into their their purples. And uh, oh. Okay. It just happened that way. We didn't plan it. <laughs> can, can, can I, 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 I don't want to get away from the questions, but I do have a, a big question, you know, and it's because I'm a convert. I'm just wondering how many other people besides me didn't know that St. Peter Basilica was not the first church that was built. I didn't know that until today. In the mass on EWTN today, the priest in this homily explains very, very well, what was the first church, which is the feast day today of uh, St. John Lateran. So, you know, and when I went to Italy, and when I when I went to see the, the Basilica, I was like, oh, there's the first church. There's my church. And uh, uh, I found out today that that's not true. And I'm just curious, does anybody, did anybody else not know that besides me? He might have been referring to the first church as we refer to the first lady. No, I mean, the, the first church that was built, that was used by the popes, is not St. Peter's Basilica, where St. Peter's buried. I didn't know that until today. Gary, you knew that, right? No. Oh, it's 
buried under the portico. Or yeah, but the portico. you're not hearing me. The first church that was used by a pope was not St. Peter's Basilica. Right. It's St. John Lateran, which right. is, the, is the feast day of that we, we recognize that church. So take the time today to watch Mass on EWTN, either at 4 o'clock or 9 o'clock, and, mm. and the priest goes through it step by step how you know our church was built you know and it, it the church, first church used by the popes was saint, saint john lateran mm. i never knew that so nobody else knew it either okay i don't feel so <laughs> um, so it wasn't the church first church it was, built is the first church used by the pope right because you know yeah. the existing basilica um saint peter's was not the first one built on that spot it was destroyed, what, in the 5th century or something like that? When, when, when the Vandals uh, sacked Rome, whatever. But well, uh, now, now I have to go all the way back to Italy to check this church out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on. Uh, discussion questions. Number one. Is there anything in this lesson that you have just heard for the first time? Yeah, St. John Lateran. Was the first time. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> watch, watch Mass today on TV, if you, or record it and just watch the homily. The Didache was new to me. I had not heard about it. You can even get, you can download it from uh, Ken, on your Kindle. The more I study the church, as in like the Didache, um, the more I find things that I remember the nuns teaching us at the time that had no value whatsoever. And yet obviously it was put in the back of my mind. So now when I'm looking at this stuff, it comes back to me and I realize the true value of what I was taught as a child. Mm Other thoughts? Okay, number two. What do you think about Pope St. Gregory's words that warn against speaking ill of bishops? And why should we take his words seriously still today? Bishops. Was that in was that in our lesson? I don't remember reading about that. Or is that something we had to quote it was not our lesson and neither was Didache. Um we can do some research. Can we on, look it up? It's on page 57, right underneath the picture. And um, the saying is sure, if anyone aspires to the office of bishop, he desires to a noble task. Oh, but this uh -huh. speaks of speaking ill yeah. of bishops. Does that mean I can't call Roger Mahoney Roger the Dodger? No. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and you dare say that in our class? <laughs> <laughs> you bet. <laughs> Oh. Well, where is that mentioned exactly about speaking ill of bishops? Maybe it's in one of the books. You know, it doesn't say it exactly. What it says instead is that we should uh, revere the office. Oh, yeah. Okay. Revere means, by definition, respect. Yes. And don't go saying nasty things like, Dodgers and stuff. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I think that must refer to the office, not to the individual. That's a good point. Because it's indisputable yeah. that some 
popes, the hideous people. Well, we all know that uh, everyone is human. So a priest, popes, whatever, um, can, can and do make mistakes. So, um, you know, I, I have a hard time with um, when a, a priest or someone is, you know, saying something or doing something that I don't agree with in our church doctrine. Uh, but, you know, it's like, who's, you know, who's supposed to do something about that? And, you know, I've, I've, um, I've left churches because of this, because of what I'm saying, because I feel, I don't, I'm not feeling comfortable. So, yeah, but it's okay in that case to question it, but maybe a next step is, is required. You're questioning or don't agree, then maybe the next step is do some, either do some research or approach the person at some point. What did you mean by that? I don't agree with it, or, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if that's appropriate, but it seems logical. I don't know. Well, you know, um, out, out um, I guess this past couple of weeks or so, uh, there's been a lot of mention about the Pope talking about gay unity yeah. and so on. And yeah. um, it was one of the things that I was, I was very, very upset about. And so I let my fingers do the walking and looked up on the internet all the stuff that was written about it, you know. And I had everything from priests saying um, he is not, it is not something the church has, has acknowledged. His authority comes when he speaks of things in the church. Um, but he does have the right for his own feelings. And, <clears throat> you know, uh, I thought to myself, well, you know, he might have the right, but you know, it also says in scriptures uh, that you have a responsibility to hold it a, a higher, uh, a higher standard if you are someone to influence the church. And so, um, but here is a, an obviously a, a situation where you could go over and say all kinds of things against the Pope, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I didn't get a satisfactory answer with all the things that I read, but it did open my mind uh, to look at things a little bit differently because we always think of him being, you know, every word that comes out of his mouth comes from God, you know? Yeah. I have a question when y'all are, are ready to go on. I have a question. Oh, sure. No, I, I wanted to make a quick uh, comment. Uh, oh, 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 because okay. um, uh, the film? No, no, an EWTN on the, on the comment about the Pope oh. that he supported uh, civil unions. Uh, on scripture and tradition, uh, they have a program that comes on weekly, Father Mitch Pasqua. And he went and he read the original document of that interview. He read it in English and he read it in Spanish because the person interviewing him was from Mexico. So he read both documents. And what he found is that it was a false uh, accusation. They edited the document and what they came out with was false. It was like what they've been doing to Trump is uh, fake news. And they twisted his words, and that's not what he said. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, he went over the documents, both in English and Spanish, and he said no. He says, and he went back. Father uh, Pasqua said, the church still believes in. Uh, they're saying, and he uh, gave the uh, the reference in the catechism. You know yes. that the church does not approve homosexuality and marriages between gays and lesbians mm -hmm. so you know i said you know i said to myself that's you know that's what's going on with this uh, false narrative that the world and the media the darkness and the evil wants to push mm -hmm. you know they're always fighting against the truth and the light 
of what the church stands for. So that was that was really well, uh, you know, repudiated by what the, the media was saying. Did the did the Vatican clarify that though? I never heard a follow up, but but he did, Father Pasqua did because he had the documents in his hand and he said, "Here, I got it in English and I got it in Spanish." And what the media is saying is not true. The way they worded it and the way they edited it was not exactly what the Pope was saying. But the shame of it is, is that's what the world has heard now. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, when they when they push their agenda, you know, that's what happens. Right. Lois, I read the same thing you, you read, but I also read that it was interpreted that if you have a child that has selected that style of life, he needs you as his family. Don't reject him as a member of your family. He needs the family he already has. Love your child anyway. Don't approve of him, but love him. And that's, that's the interpretation that I read that the Pope meant when he said he needs a uh, homosexual needs a family. Yeah, keep, that's what keep your Father, child close to you. Yeah, that's what Father Mitch Pasqua and also, also uh, so learned light and, and actions, but love first. I have, I got something, uh, and unfortunately, it's I, I can't put my hand on it real fast. Uh, I will make a copy of it, which is which actually translates the not the whole thing, but translates the key thing. And and what happened with the media is um, they they rarely ever do this. They conflate two ideas, lay them on top of each other, no. and take things completely out of context. So that's exactly what they've done. I got this from uh, uh, an Opus Dei person, and uh, they, they're about as conservative as you get. And if they were going to be um a aggravated they'd be really aggravated but what the only thing they're aggravated about is that the, the pope's words were taken out of context what i understand the pope said and by the way this was back when he was the arch or the cardinal archbishop in in uh argentina as he was when they were uh working to pass their law he didn't want it to be called marriage. He wanted it to be called a civil union. That way, the the gay couple, uh, gay or lesbian couple, could have legal rights with each other, but they wouldn't be recognized as a marriage because okay. marriage, and he said it, marriage is between a man and a woman. He didn't, uh, he, he didn't conflate that. Later he said, and Lois uh, uh, rightly said it, that if someone is gay and living a gay lifestyle, they still need a family just like, you know, don't shun them away. So, I mean, those, are, and those two ideas got laid on top of each other uh, as if they were spoken at the same time, affirming um, homosexuality, affirming, uh, gay marriage, etc. So the media did a did its typical. Uh, the the mainstream media loves to do that. Let's just put it that way. We'll just leave it. At, I'll shut up. Thank so you, Mary. As a matter of fact, your explanation was better than what I've gone and researched. And I think the big thing was there was a Russian producer who made a film on what you just said and tweaked it the way he wanted it, obviously. And um, he won awards for his documentary that he made on Pope um, Francis. Mm -hmm. And it included this tweaking of what <coughs> he said to make it sound like uh, he was approving of gay marriage mm. and mm -hmm. the union of gays. So this reminds me of um, the university series uh, during Lent and how John Allen was faithfully coming to um, talk to us about what was going on with the Pope. 
And I'm just wondering, is there any possibility that we can we can Zoom our guest speakers? Yes, yes, that's, uh, what, yes we're, that's what they're doing. We're, about that. we're oh. already talking about that. Uh, awesome. You're gonna have a, a Zoomed um, uh, university this year. I, the details aren't worked out for sure, uh, but whether we have just one talk a night or several talks a night, uh, but um, yeah, they will try to, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll get it, John Allen, and John, he'll be in Rome. He'll be in Rome, and awesome. it'll be four yeah. in the morning or something yeah. like that, whatever it is, you know, and, awesome. and he'll be uh, uh, talking to us. And uh, and uh, I even suggested let's get uh, Cardinal Dolan. Or, you know, I mean, if they don't have to be here, you right. know, just, just do it, you know. So, anyway. Yes, we need to carry on that tradition. Right. right. Yeah. Oh, I'm excited. Thanks. Well, with that note, I think we're finished with this portion. Rita? Boy, a week early. Yeah, Don, is okay. still there? Carmen? I am oh, may I ask my question? Did, did we finish the... Uh, the, the... They did number two. Okay, well... Sorry. Do you have more? The, the, Gre St. Gregory... It was Pope kind of after the fall, after Rome had kind of fallen apart. So um, I, I think uh, I wrote down last week that it was from 590 to 604. So Rome was no longer the center of the empire for, for 200 years and, and had been sacked and all that sort of stuff. Gregory takes over Rome, it, you know, because the only organization that had had any organization, if you will, had any sure. ruling capability or had any ability to, to uh, manage things was the church. And this is when the church, yeah, unfortunately, this is when the church starts becoming actually a power, if you will, because it takes, it, he, he, under his leadership, starts running Rome so that Rome doesn't, you know, so that people don't starve to death and all that sort of thing. So that's part of what it is. The other thing that he pushes is that unity has to be maintained under the Eucharist. And where do we get our, our succession? We get it from the bishop. And so the apostolic succession was really important because we all share the same bread. And so he was he was just pushing, I mean, we already said it, unity, unity, unity. That was his thing. And that that being speaking ill of the bishop is actually speaking disunity. Uh, we can disagree with our bishops, but but you know, that's that's one thing. But to speak ill of them is another thing. That that's so. Uh, I think that's the that's where he was coming from. So I'm sorry that was oh, uh, I appreciate a little, little broader answer there. Yeah, thank you for expanding on that. He also wrote has a school of pastors, which is still in use today. I'm sorry, say again. What? Oh, the the school of pastors. Yeah. Can you repeat that again? I I didn't get a. He also wrote the rule of pastors. It's okay. still in use today. Yeah. Okay. Mm. The rule of pastors. Mm. Mm. Carmen, did you say? Did you want to say something? Yes. Uh, yes. It. This is regarding what we've been talking about uh, throughout. As the um, don't speak ill uh, about a respecting the office of the priest, the bishop. At the Last Supper, when Jesus um, uh, created or gave his body and blood through the Eucharist, and when he washed the feet of the apostles, uh, he was empowering his apostles, right? to to do the same right am i right yes okay yes. Uh, one of his apostles was judas 
And so at that time, at the Last Supper, Judas was also empowered, right, mm -hmm. to celebrate the Eucharist and to, well, all of the, to become a priest or to, so this is true, right? Am I thinking right? So even Judas could have celebrated the Eucharist. Did he say it right, the Eucharist, or did he yes. leave just before the Eucharist? Is that right or not? I don't know. Because... I think because, he left this before the meal. That's what I was going to... Although... Did he leave? The, the no. The one I dip... Uh, uh huh. The one I dip... Um, the bread in, yeah. The bread, you know, like into the oil. I'm sure that's what that's they, right. They dipped it into the oil uh, is the one. So um, I, I'd have to go look at the the uh, um, you know the Eucharistic the, the Last Supper yes to see if Judas had had already gone. Uh, but my sense is he had actually already gone. Uh, and if that's the case, then no question. Right. There. But had he been there, yeah, he would have been the, um, he would have been um, a priest. He, he'd have been, a, he's an apostle, you know, so he's good. But he'd uh, been authorized or. Suddenly he hangs himself. So. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. He must have, he must have been because they had to replace him. His office was there. Right, right. Yeah, but, that but John, I don't, I don't think that means that he, uh, had had been present at the meal. It's just that there were twelve, and now there were eleven, and mm -hmm. so they 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 wanted to get the number back up to twelve. But they didn't uh, say to refill the office. They said to replace him. Well, it, it, yeah. I'm, I'm not debating your words. I, I I just think the timing is such. Give me, you guys. Okay, thank well, you. Talk among yourselves. Let me go look at something. <laughs> <laughs> like the answer? <laughs> yeah, let me go look up. Uh, you know what? It's a great thing to have all this stuff on your cell phone. <laughs> you know, I, I can do that kind of research myself. You don't have to do it on my account. But I just it, it just hit me uh, last night. Well, if he was there, then he was, he was given the great, authority. Great question. Sure. But give me a great answer. <laughs> I'll do my best. Uh, Don, uh, are you ready for a film? Yep. Give me one sec. Absolutely. Thank you. And in the meantime, should, can we all mute our our um, tablets or whatever we have? Uh, and I just wanted to add that St. John Lateran, I just, I'm looking it up, it is it to this day, it is the seat of the Roman pontiff. I looked it up while we were talking and the original St. John Lateran, obviously what's built today is not the original church. I mean, we have fires and various things, uh, but the original one was, it says consecrated in 324 AD and the original St. Peter's, uh, it gave it a, an approximate, but it wasn't even started until like 333. It was consecrated in 360 or something like that. So um, it, it may well be the oldest church in Rome. I don't know if there were churches anywhere else other than home churches because Christianity wasn't a legal religion. At, until uh, Constantine. Well, that's right. The Edict of Milan, right? Okay, I'm muting. I'm looking at pictures of it. Oh. Uh, it's. The Syrian city of Edessa lay near the border between the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire. It was an important stop along the trade routes that ran from east to west. In Edessa's marketplace, you could find silks and spices, exotic foods, and beautiful works of art and craft. You could also find all kinds of crazy ideas. 
every heresy seemed to pass through Edessa on its way from one side of the world to the other. And so many of those heresies took root there. A deacon in the middle of the fourth century, St. Ephraim saw this situation and lamented it. In his city, there were Arians and Manichaeans, Marcionites and Gnostics. So many different groups were claiming to be the bearers of the true faith that ordinary Christians were left confused. And who was smart enough to figure it all out? And even worse, these heresies were sometimes more effective at evangelism than the Catholics. One of their most effective techniques was to set their teachings to catchy melodies, which caused their errors to spread like wildfire as the residents of Edessa sang these popular songs. So Ephraim decided to do something about it. He decided to write better hymns than the heretics. He composed beautiful lyrics in the Syriac language and set them to the familiar melodies of the traditional songs of Edessa. Not only that, he recruited an all-female chorus to sing his hymns, and they sang them in the marketplace. Never before in the history of the church had evangelization been done this way. And Ephraim penned more hymns than all the heretics combined. More than 400 have survived to our day. He wrote Christmas carols and Easter hymns. He wrote hymns that directly refuted the heresies. He even set his homilies to music. And the church still sings his songs today because they're still relevant, like so much else that we find when we explore the Bible and the church fathers. Welcome back to the Bible and the Church Fathers. By this point in our study, I'm betting you've already come to a deeper appreciation for the lives and teachings of the Church Fathers. They're an incredible gift to us. Now we'll continue to unwrap that gift with what I think you'll find to be a fascinating discussion of their understanding and proclamation of something called mystagogy, a word that means doctrine of the mysteries. But to set up our topic, we're going to begin this lesson with just something a little different an art history lesson, kind of. And we'll start in the catacombs. If you've ever been to Rome, odds are you've visited the catacombs. They're a very popular destination. And the reason is that in these subterranean grave sites, you'll find some of the church's greatest artistic treasures. Along the ancient and low stone walls are images and ancient graffiti left by the first Christians. And what's fascinating is that so many of the images are typological, sacramental images, like the Great Flood in Noah's Ark, which the New Testament says is a foreshadowing of baptism. There are also pictures of the loaves and fishes from John chapter 6, images that foreshadow the Eucharist. Then there are the paintings of the priest king of Salem, the mysterious Melchizedek, and his offering of bread and wine to Abraham in Genesis 14, another foreshadowing of the Eucharist. Now, four hours northeast of Rome, on the coast of the Adriatic Sea, lies the ancient town of Ravenna, one of the most important outposts of the late Roman Empire. In Ravenna, you'll find some of the most intact Christian art from this early period of the church. The art is very primitive in its influences, even though it's from the 5th century. And it's interesting because in the mosaics that adorn the baptistries and catacombs, you often see images of an Old Testament type paired with its New Testament fulfillment. Now, why did the early Christians do art this way? The answer is because they were decorating sacred spaces, and it was in worship that they encountered the biblical stories. In a sense, it was almost like watching a movie where they could look up at the walls and see the story of salvation history played out before them. Remember, there were no printing presses at the time. Books were incredibly expensive and many people were illiterate. So the art that adorned the worship spaces allowed the Christians to see what they couldn't read. And what they saw was the Old Testament foreshadowing the New and the New Testament fulfilling the Old. They saw the typology, which we discussed back in Lesson 3. But these first Christians knew they weren't just looking at pictures. In a sense, they were stepping into those pictures. They were participating in the very story the images told through their participation in the sacraments. They participated through baptism and in the Eucharist. You see, 
people understood that. The ancient Christians knew that it was in the liturgy we are joined to Christ and his saving mysteries. It's in the liturgy that salvation history continues to be played out. That's why the Catechism of the Catholic Church declares that the liturgy is the summit toward which the activity of the church is directed. Importantly, the Catechism notes that the liturgy is the privileged place for catechizing the people of God. Now, why? Why is the liturgy the best place for us to be instructed in the faith? Because it's the place where Christ actually affects our transformation. It's where we are changed and renewed. The early Christians didn't need to be reminded of that. Catechesis was an ordinary and expected part of the liturgy. In fact, it took place primarily in the context of the Mass. Maybe you've already noticed that many of the quotes we've cited from the Fathers over the past several sessions weren't pulled from letters or books. They came from homilies. They came from sermons in which the Fathers were teaching the faith to their congregations in the liturgy. Now, oftentimes, this teaching focused on what we call the rule of faith, which is a brief creed-like summary of their beliefs. And while the formulas of the rule may have varied slightly from place to place, their overall uniformity is remarkable. Like the baptismal creeds we use today, the rule described how God became man, how Jesus was crucified, rose again and was glorified, and how all those events were foretold and foreshadowed in the Old Testament. But all that teaching was just preparation for more teaching. It was preparation for mystagogy, which I mentioned in the introduction. Taken from the Greek word mystagogia, mystagogy essentially means the doctrine of the mysteries. So just as biology studies living organisms and anthropology studies man, mystagogy studies the mysteries of Christ. More specifically, mystagogy refers to the teaching of the mysteries of Christ to newly baptized believers, which generally lasted from Easter to Pentecost. So before Easter, you learn salvation history. You learn the story of how God has been working from the beginning of time to bring us to salvation. Then, once baptized, the veil of the Holy Holies was lifted, so to speak, and the new Christian was guided step by step into the hidden truths of Christ. All the rites and words were now explained. And realize that the biblical preparation the early Christians received before baptism was extremely important. Why? Because the mystagogical instructions of the fathers were primarily explanations of sacred scripture. The biblical stories, types, and foreshadows that the believer had already learned in preparation for entrance into the body now found their end. They found their full explanation, their completion in mystagogical catechesis. You see, at its heart, mystagogy is all about promise and fulfillment in sacramental terms. It's an unveiling of the relationship between the Old and New Testaments and the sacramental rites of the church. It shows how they're all connected through Jesus Christ. Now, I realize that this can be a little difficult to wrap your mind around, so let's use an example to help out. Let's look at the mystagogical connection between the Passover and the Eucharist. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the story of the original Passover when the Israelites were freed from being slaves in Egypt. You remember that in order to keep the angel of death from killing their firstborn, the Israelites had to do something. They had to kill an unblemished lamb, spread its blood on their doorpost, and then eat it. Well, through mystagogical catechesis, or teaching, the fathers helped people see how this sacrificial meal was actually a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. They would point out how Jesus is the true Lamb of God, whose blood was shed to deliver us from sin. They would also explain that when we consume his body and drink his blood, we, like the Israelites, are delivered from death. We receive God's own life within us. So in all that, the fathers help the newly baptized Christians see how Jesus connects the Mass we celebrate with the Passover liturgy of the Israelites. You see, the fathers knew that salvation history and all their moral instruction was ultimately ordered 
to the sacraments. After all, it's in the sacramental liturgy that we receive a foretaste of heaven, a communion with our Lord in all his glory. It's also in the sacraments that we receive the grace we need to live a moral life and get to heaven. Put simply, the sacraments were and are foundational to the Christian life. That's why St. Irenaeus stated that our way of thinking is attuned to the Eucharist, and the Eucharist in turn confirms our way of thinking. It's also why, once baptized, new believers needed to learn how to apply the typology they had learned as catechumens to the rites they could now celebrate. They needed what the great patristic scholar Enrico Mazza called the explanation of the mystery hidden in scriptures and celebrated in the liturgy. And not surprisingly, many of the church fathers are still remembered for their mystagogical teaching. They're remembered for the beauty and clarity with which they unveiled the mysteries. I'm talking about men like Justin Martyr, Clement of Alexandria, and Cyril of Jerusalem. Also, St. Ambrose of Milan, St. Augustine, and St. John Chrysostom, as well as his buddy, Theodore of Upswestia. So let's take a look at how one of those fathers, Justin Martyr, provides a classic mystagogical interpretation of the famous prophecy of Malachi 1, 10, and 11. Though we heard it in our last lesson, let's quickly refresh our memory of this passage that we often hear at Mass in the third Eucharistic prayer. Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire upon my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is great among the nations. And in every place, incense is offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name is great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. In true mystagogical fashion, St. Justin declares in the second century that Malachi's prophecy has been fulfilled in the Eucharistic sacrifice. In his famous dialogue with Trifo the Jew, he says that Malachi speaks of those Gentiles, namely us, who in every place offer sacrifices to him, that is, the bread of the Eucharist and also the cup of the Eucharist, affirming both that we glorify his name and that you profane it. In other words, Justin illuminates how the promise of the Old Testament comes to New Testament fulfillment in sacramental terms. But there's something very interesting to point out here. Notice that in his mystagogical interpretation, Justin only lifts the veil a little bit. He doesn't lay all his cards on the table. Like St. Paul, who told the Corinthians, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it, Justin, in his dialogue with Trifo, doesn't let the non-Christian all the way inside the mystery. He doesn't go as far as he could go. And you have to realize that even a little bit of unveiling was rare at this time. For the first several hundred years of Christianity, discussions of the sacramental rites were off limits to those who had not yet put on Christ. Until the fourth century, the fathers and others fairly consistently observed something we call the discipline of the secret. Like Justin Martyr, men such as Origen, Tertullian and Clement of Alexandria would begin to reveal something about the sacraments, hint about them, but then pull back saying, we know we can't commit that to writing, or we know we can't say that when the unbaptized are present. So we have these echoes of mystagogy in the early fathers, but for the most part, they observe a certain reticence, a certain control in talking about the sacraments. And notice that it wasn't just that the unbaptized couldn't receive the Eucharist. Even teaching regarding the sacred mysteries could not be heard until a person had been fully initiated into the faith. With its legalization under Constantine in the fourth century, that all changed. The church began to preserve its secret teachings. We can now read the explosion of mystagogical preaching that a newly minted Christian experienced. As St. Cyril of Jerusalem told his newly baptized flock in the fourth century, I have long wished, O true and beloved children of the church, to speak to you about these spiritual and heavenly mysteries. But since I knew that seeing is far more persuasive than hearing, I waited till now 
when your present experience has left you more open to the influence of my words. Now I might lead you by the hand into the brighter and more fragrant meadow of the paradise before us. St. Cyril is particularly famous for his 23 catechetical lectures. 18 of them are addressed to candidates for baptism. The other five are known as his mystagogical catechesis that explained the mysteries in which the newly baptized had just participated. Here's how this third century Bishop of Jerusalem and doctor of the church explains what he does in these catechesis. He says, you were found worthy of divine and life-giving baptism, and now you are ready to receive the more sacred mysteries. Now it's time to set before you a banquet of more perfect instructions. So let us teach you these things exactly, that you may know the effect worked upon you on that evening of your baptism. In other words, you've been baptized, you've had the sacraments, now I can tell you about them. Now I can explain how the stories of scripture you've already learned are connected to the sacramental rites of the church. Next, St. Cyril guides his freshly baptized listeners through the ritual they have just experienced step by step. He leads them from the Old Testament type to its New Testament fulfillment and on into the sacramental mystery of Jesus Christ. First, you entered into the vestibule of the baptistry. There, facing west, you heard the command to stretch forth your hand, and as if you were in the presence of Satan, you renounced him. Now you must know that this was prefigured in ancient history. For when Pharaoh, that most bitter and cruel tyrant, was oppressing the free and noble Hebrews, God sent Moses to bring them out of the evil bondage of the Egyptians. Then the doorposts were anointed with the blood of a lamb that the destroyer might flee from the houses that had the sign of the blood, and the Hebrew people were marvelously delivered. But after their rescue, the enemy pursued them and saw the sea miraculously parted for them. Nevertheless, he went on, following close in their footsteps, and was all at once overwhelmed and engulfed in the Red Sea. Cyril then continues by showing the New Testament fulfillment of these Old Testament stories. Now turn from the old to the new, from the figure to the reality. There we have Moses sent from God to Egypt. Here we have Christ sent forth from his Father into the world. There so that Moses might lead forth an afflicted people out of Egypt. Here so that Christ might rescue those who are oppressed in the world under sin. There the blood of a lamb was the spell against the destroyer. Here, the blood of the Lamb without blemish, Jesus Christ, is made the charm to scare evil spirits. There, the tyrant was pursuing that ancient people all the way to the sea. And here, the daring and shameless spirit, the author of evil, follows you even to the streams of salvation. The tyrant of old was drowned in the sea, and this present one disappears in the water of salvation. So. Pharaoh drowned in the Red Sea, the devil drowns in baptism. Moses led the Israelites out of slavery through the Red Sea. Christ leads us out of slavery to sin through the waters of baptism. This is the stuff of mystagogy. The old is fulfilled in the new, which leads to a celebration of the mysteries of Christ through the sacraments. Christ connects the events of salvation history to the rites of the church, which lead us into his mysteries into his divine life. By now I'm betting that you're starting to see how all of what we've been talking about over the course of this series fits together. The story of our salvation revealed in scripture is one of promise and fulfillment, of sacrifice and salvation. The Old Testament covenants culminate in the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. And he is the thread that not only connects the Old and New Testaments, but also unites them to the sacramental liturgy he institutes through the church he founded. That's the incredible message so powerfully explained and spread by the fathers of the church. 
And that's the message you and I need to receive into our hearts that we need to live out in the midst of this fallen world. So to help us do that, in our next lesson, we're going to dive into the incredible teaching of two of the most famous fathers in the history of our faith, St. John Chrysostom and St. Augustine of Hippo. Until then, God bless you. I hope you all get a wow from that. Wow is, wow is the word. <laughs> wow. Awesome. And St. Augustine of Hippo, is that the same as St. Augustine of Carthage? Not yeah. the same person? No. So. The one we call St. Augustine is St. Augustine of Hippo. I don't know who the one of Carthage is. Hmm. Well, that's where he lived when he was dialoguing with St. Jerome of Jerusalem. Well, then it's the same. Okay. Got an insight. Oh, by the way, St. Augustine, remember, I'm a former Protestant. That's how I learned his name. Was ah, Augustine. okay. But that there is a St. Augustine. That's a city in uh, oh, Florida. Florida. <laughs> Florida. <laughs> yeah. And I went to St. Augustine's Elementary School in Culver oh, City. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, and a, and as I remember, he was a, a pagan for into his thirties, I think. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. And his mother followed him everywhere to, and prayed that he would change. Mm. St. Monica. Ah. Yeah, the video made a, a very uh, good point because when you go to uh, the churches in Europe, especially in Italy, they their icons and the stained glass were made to show the events in, of the Bible, both yeah. in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I remember when we went to uh, to Paris uh, to the Church of uh, Notre Dame, someone I think it might have been the guide uh, told us it was a, another church, which was about a block block and uh, block and a half away from Notre Dame. And <clears throat> we went in, and they showed all the main events from the Old Testament to the New Testament. I mean all the way around the church you could start all the way back from genesis all the way up to to the passion of, of the christ and it was amazing i mean we stood there you know you could stay there like half a day looking at all the pictures and relating to the events in, in the bible it was really really beautiful when i lived, when I lived in paris uh that was my favorite place to visit it's uh just the entire room is just all stained glass. It's just incredible. It's it feels like you're sitting in a in a in a jewelry box just full of just these this beautiful stained glass, and it was built supposedly to house uh, the crown uh, a thorn from the crown of thorns. Mm -hmm. That's what it was built for. It's small, but it's just it's my favorite place in all of Paris. And it is literally a block and a half from Notre Dame. Yeah, do you remember the name of that church? Uh, I was trying to look. It starts with a C. Uh, it's um, Saint Chapelle. Sacred. That's it. Yeah. yeah. What was it? Saint Chapelle. Saint Chapelle. Yeah. Yeah. Saint -Chapelle. Yeah. And it was my favorite spot. And I could remember. <laughs> well, can you imagine before the age of readily available books, contemplation in a church like that? could more than suffice to instruct, I would think. Well, yeah, and, and as a preacher, to be able to walk around or point to a picture and then explain that picture in a homily would be absolutely phenomenal. Uh, you know, because now I, I, something he said about 
they're they were in it you know that the no longer was it just a you know it's not just words on a page but it's in it i mean how many times have you uh heard uh something in a homily where they paint you know, verbally, a picture, and all of a sudden you're sucked into that that scene, and 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 you li you're living that scene, uh, and and you know to have it then also graphically. So now you got a multimedia kind of thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> and and it's up there. Uh, I think that'd be phenomenal. And and also, I, I hate to say it because even my mind drifts from time to time. I've heard these prayers. Uh, a lot of times, and sometimes I've been known to drift a little bit, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, it'd be great to have something that I'm looking at that's the birth of Christ, or the, you know, the, whatever, you know, some, some um, saint's life, or whatever. I mean, it would be great to be able to have that. You don't have to go all the way to Europe to see something like that. St. Nicholas Cathedral, it's an Orthodox church. Um, my granddaughter was married in it. Uh, it. It doesn't certainly look like a cathedral that we look at cathedrals. Um, but inside, it literally has the entire Old and New Testament uh, drawn all the way across on every single <coughs> uh, is, it, that, is that the gold dome you see from the freeway? You mean on the five like Burbank area? No. Oh. Is that the one in Granada Hills? This, 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 That's Armenian. Los okay. Angeles, an Armenian Los church Angeles. over there. Yeah, this yeah. one is in okay. Los Angeles. So where is St. Nicholas? It's in Los Angeles. Well, that doesn't help much. I know it doesn't help much. What can I tell you? I don't remember. <laughs> I, I think we need a class field trip. There you go. I think that'd be wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you know, our own, our own uh, cathedral, which... I think is not a good looking building from the outside, but it is, it is kind of awesome on the inside. Just think of the tapestries that are running down the, the sides of that cathedral yeah. with all the saints. I mean, if, you know, there's, yeah. you believe in the communion of saints and there it is depicted right there. You can right. see it down both sides of the cathedral. Uh, and, and I don't know if you know it or not, but not, Everyone who's up there is a is a named saint. There are a few people up there because they're us. Yeah. In the you know because we are in the communion of saints right here. You know being being you know when we're at mass, um, you know it, it's it's an awesome view of what of what we believe of of the prayer that we we say. You know it's part of our creed. That we believe that they're there and they're they're praying with us and for us. So I mean, it, to me, that's a that's an awesome sight. That's my favorite part of the cathedral are the banners. Yeah. Uh, and it not only are they beautiful and as you say, um, but but uh, they're inspirational. Yeah. I mean, if you have a favorite saint or saints you've never heard of, what a beautiful way to depict them. Yeah, and if you go down to the basement uh, where the uh, where the mausoleum is, they have some beautiful stained glass as you walk along the hallway. That's that's really pretty. So if you get, go to the cathedral, don't don't forget to go down to the basement in that area. So, Wasn't that the stained glass from the old cathedral? I don't know. Yeah, I, it is. I, yeah, and Gregory Peck's in there too. Right, and uh, and also if you go to to where the baptismal font is, you'll see uh, a tapestry on the baptism of Christ. Uh, you know, if, if you think of the building, how the, yeah, you, you can't miss it. it. I mean, the building is a, is a huge basilica cross, you know, it's a big cross, right? The, where the seating is. At the foot of the cross is the, a baptismal font that's huge. And one of the tapestries is the baptism of Christ. If you go into room two at St. Max, you'll see a, a, a miniature of that. Uh, if you go uh, see the fourth banner on the left side facing the altar has St. Max on it. I'm sure you can find all the other saints in our, 
in our archdiocese are probably all depicted there. So I, I believe that's what they did. Thank you. Are we ready to say our um, yeah. closing prayer? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> we praise you, our loving God, as we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, you have given us the great day of rejoicing. Jesus Christ, the, the stone rejected by the builders, has become the cornerstone of the church, our spiritual home. Shed upon your church the rays of your glory, that it may be seen as the gate of salvation open to all nations. Let cries of joy and exultation ring out from its tent to celebrate the wonder of Christ's resurrection. Bless the Lord. Praise and exalt him above all forever. Bless the Lord. Praise, Praise and exalt him above, above all forever. Above all forever. Loving God, you make all things work together for good for those who love you. Give us wisdom to find our true treasure in you and to share the wealth of our faith with others. Bless the Lord. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. Praise Praise Lord. 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 Oh God, Mary received your word and trusted, and trusted in you wholeheartedly. Help us to give ourselves to you and animate us to be instruments of your reconciliation and peace. Bless the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Look kindly on all who put their trust in our prayers. Fill them with every bodily and spiritual grace as we pray. Jacob. Boy, Jacob. Jacob. Kevin. Uh -huh. Kevin. 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 Oh, Kevin. Debbie, Crystal. Rumi, and, and Andrew. Kathy. Kathy. Ruby. Ruby. And Andrew. And Andrew. <clears throat> Mariela. Crystal. Mariela. Crystal. 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 My daughter Elizabeth and her family. Elizabeth, Elizabeth and her family. 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 Yana. 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 Allison. 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 Rebecca. Mother-in-law and grandchildren, Jennifer, Sarah, and Brandon. Oh, Brandon, Jennifer, Sarah, Jennifer, and Brandon. Sarah, Brandon, Virginia. Virginia. Mary Ellen. Mary Ellen. Mason. 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 My sister Mary. 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 Angela. 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 Rebecca. 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 Nathaniel. Joseph. Nathaniel. Joseph. Kathy. 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 Diana. 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 Monica and Patricia. Monica, Monica and, and, and Patricia. For the unborn. For the unborn. For the unborn. For the unborn. Father Al and John. Father, Father, Al. Father Al and John. D. 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 For President of the election. For the president. The president and the president. And peace. Peace. For peace. Bless the Lord. Praise and exalt him above all. Bless, Bless the Lord. Lord. Praise, Praise, Praise the Lord. Praise and exalt him above all forever. forever. You have given us faith and grace to follow you. And is, it is in your word that we are rounded into the person that we were created to be. Is the law then opposed to the promises of God? Of course not. For if a law had been given that could bring life, then righteousness would in reality come from the law. 
but scripture can find all things under the power of sin, that through faith in Jesus Christ, the promise might be given to those who believe. Before faith came, we were held in custody under law, confined for the faith that was to be revealed. Consequently, the law was our disciplinarian for Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a disciplinarian, for through faith, you are all children of God in Christ Jesus. Bless, Bless the Lord, Lord. Lord. and praise all forever. 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 Um, before everyone leaves, I want to mention a couple of things. Number one, uh, we only have three more weeks, and this lesson will be finished. But uh, when I was talking to Gary way back when, like before June, we were try I was trying to figure out what to do uh, for our Bible studies. And Gary had mentioned that we do Mark. And so I have uh, many of you, I've, I've given you this information. I will send it once again uh, through email. And I know I didn't give you anything for Mark yet. Uh, but I will take care of that and uh, send that also to you. So anyone who wishes to continue with the Bible study, um, the, uh, there's 16 weeks left until the end of us our usual Bible study. There's 16 um, chapters in Mark. It takes care of all of our needs. So I will send you the information on this again in um through email. Okay. By the way, the reason I suggested Mark is starting in three weeks, we will be into the new year, Michael B, which is based primarily on the book of Mark uh, with some additional stuff from the book of John. But so it at least gives us, uh, you know, it's kind of a way of uh, helping us uh, along as we move through the uh, liturgical year. That's very good. Yeah. I, I have a very general question. Does anyone know how Father Jim Mayer is? He, I don't know if he's still alive. I didn't know if anybody um, knew. I got, a, I got a letter from him, you know, that he sent to a lot of people a couple months ago. I, I uh, did too. Oh, so you got it too. So uh, since then I don't have an update but i i keep checking their bulletin online uh -huh. to see if he's still with us right so i don't know anybody that uh i know i think i know one person that might have a closer connection to him but you know i could make a call to the parish and get an update where is the parish st rose de lima, saint rose of lima. Oh. yeah mm. And also our, our dear friend uh, from past Bible study, Marie Dowd, passed away. Yes. And oh. Father People, uh, Father Father um, Peter came to um, give the homily and mass for her. It was beautiful. We were there. It was very beautiful. Yes. What what was her name? Marie Dowd. D O W D. Rita, or, or whoever sent the uh, uh, video of, of Father Dave and the Mass, that was great. Thank you. About the Mass. Thank you for sending that. Okay. Well, everyone, uh, it's time to go. Uh, we're really early this time. <laughs> so, despite the fact that our numbering in our lessons is 129 <laughs> back to <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll keep together we try to keep glued and figure out what they're trying to say and have a great week God bless you all you know you're always in my prayers every day and um, God be with you all week I want to suggest bye everyone God bless bye. Bye. I want to suggest everybody that God, God bless you. Bye. Don't just define 
Mr. Goji. I want you to think of examples of Mr. Goji that, uh, you know, mean something to you be, because you guys, most of you were baptized as Catholics early, early on, right? I mean, right. two weeks year. old. Yeah, so maybe. You went through the Mr. Goji completely differently than an adult would who is, is baptized. So you've been imbued into the faith. And so some, somehow the faith was handed to you and those mysteries explained. So think about how that was done, what, what mysteries mean the most to you, rather than just define, you know, the, do the doctrine, uh, you know, what, what was it? The doctrine of, uh, of the mysteries. That's, yeah, come on, go, go a little deeper. Good point. <laughs> it applies in our lives. Right. Okay. Thanks, Thanks. Gary. Thanks. Bye. Great week. Bye. 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 Bye.